Yeah, I had a shark try to f*** me. <laughs> oh, no! I still get teased about it by my friends. They will never let me live it down. So I started scuba diving in 2014. I got all of the recreational certifications that I can that Patty offers all the way up to master scuba diver. So that's open water, advanced open water, rescue diver, master scuba diver, all that jazz. I do have a fair bit of diving experience. Let's go with some weird ones first. Okay. So I was diving off the coast of Key Largo down in Florida, and it was my very first night dive. I had just got my advanced open water. I had either just gotten it or was working on it, but it was my first night dive. So we go underwater on top of this reef. We go about 40, 45 feet down. And, you know, it's pitch black down there. We have dive flashlights. Aside from those flashlights, if, if you don't have the flashlight on, you cannot see your hand in front of your face. It is that dark. Even if there is moonlight on the surface, it doesn't matter. So I'm down there, and this is where inexperienced me did something a little stupid. I was hanging back a little bit from the rest of the group because I was playing around with a lobster. I mean, lobsters are pretty cool. Well, especially the uh, spiny lobsters that they have down in the Caribbean. Ooh, hell yeah. They're bigger. They don't have those two front claws. And they taste better, too. Mm. If you order lobster at a restaurant and it tastes naturally sweet, you did not get a Maine lobster or a Chesapeake Bay lobster or whatever. You got spiny lobster imported from the Caribbean because generally speaking, they have larger populations. They're bigger and they're sweeter. They're better tasting. So don't take it as a bad thing. They're just better tasting. So I'm playing with this lobster and I turn around to go back to the group and I'm only probably 20 feet or so from them. And I'm swimming along and all of a sudden it gets harder and harder and harder to get air out of my mouthpiece. Like I'm really having to like inhale with force. Yeah. I'm like, that's really weird. The dive just started. So I look down at my pressure gauge and I see I have 500 PSI left. For reference, you're not even really supposed to let it get that low. It's bad for the tank if it does get that low. And aside from that, you're never going to get the full pressurization's worth of air because the restrictor systems in your mouthpiece that can take air from 3,000 PSI to a breathable pressure, it takes a lot of pressure to get through those restrictor systems. By the time you hit 500 PSI, you only have a couple of breaths left. Restrictor, oh, and that's what happened. Swimming to get to my dive buddy so I can give him this signal. This signal means out of air. Oh, I'm about halfway there and the air runs dry. No more air. And I don't have any air in my lungs either. That's it. I don't have any air in my lungs. It's pitch black. I'm, I'm about 10 feet from the dive group and another 10 feet from my dive buddy who's at the front of the dive group because my dive buddy was the dive instructor. So I have nothing in my lungs and I am having to swim a good 20 feet to get there, which isn't easy because they are moving as well. But I somehow make it there and I give the signal and he was really great about it. He was really fast about it. You know, he does the underarm sweep, gives me his emergency mouthpiece. So all tanks have at least four hoses. The first one is your mouthpiece. The second one is another mouthpiece, but it's yellow. It's bright yellow. You can't miss it. Mm. The third hose goes to your pressure gauge. And the fourth hose goes to your BCD. That's your buoyancy control device. It's this vest that you wear that inflates. It's got weight pockets on it, and it also inflates, and it helps you stay neutrally buoyant underwater. So he signals to the group for the rest of the group to join up with another dive instructor who's about 20, 30 feet away. And he tells them, just go over there. They do that, and he takes me, and we immediately surface. We get back on the boat, and I get my tank swapped out. And I was like, yeah, that was pretty scary, especially for my first night dive experience. That's pretty scary. Yeah. What caused it? Because I'm sitting there in all my dive gear at the edge of the boat. Guy swapping the tanks is like, oh, would you look at this? 
Your tank has a hole in the O-ring at the top. It was constantly leaking air bubbles, but because it was pitch black, we couldn't see it. We couldn't see it. And it was so early into the dive that I didn't even think to begin on checking my pressure. Mm -hmm. I knew when I started the dive, it was 3000 PSI. About five or 10 minutes into it, I was out. The other thing is having to do an emergency surface like that. Yeah, you're trying to take it slower, but there definitely is this sense of urgency too. Yeah, so there was a hole in my tank. You don't have to worry about pressurization going up. You do have to worry about equalization going down. Mm. So going down, you see a lot of people moving their mouths and plugging their nose. So you plug your nose and you blow, and that equalizes the pressure in your ears. You have to do that every couple of feet on the way down, about every three feet or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where the majority of diving injuries happen is ruptured eardrums because they kept going down when they couldn't equalize. Mm. So if you can't equalize, you don't go down, you're just going to hurt yourself. So anyways, we're back up at the surface get the tank swapped, go back down. And now we're looking for the group, which is another issue because there's no way to identify who's in the group. All we see are several different groups that have flashlights. We don't know which one's ours. So we're looking at them and I feel just this massive force just shove me from behind. Like I got hit by a car. I turn around and there's a fish there that is the size of a car. It's a Goliath grouper. It's a really big Goliath grouper who's actually kind of famous on that reef. The locals call him Mo. He rams India to scare you. He likes doing that. But you know what else he likes? Pets. So here I am, after having almost just died, giving a fish the size of a minivan belly rubs. <laughs> And as I'm rubbing this giant fish that, if it wanted to, could probably swallow me in a single gulp, <laughs> our diving group comes up on us. And they see this fish, and I can definitely see some of the less experienced divers in the group sort of, like, freaking out. Like, <laughs> oh my god, what is that? Like, they're kind of flailing and shit, because, you know, you can't really talk underwater. And they're like, what the hell? So now we're just having this fucking group therapy session with a fish. <laughs> That's an experience I doubt a lot of divers have. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Another experience that I doubt most divers have is almost getting mated by a shark. Ooh. Yeah, I had a shark try to fuck me. <laughs> oh no! I still get teased about it by my friends. They will never let me live it down. So this happened off the coast of an island in the Caribbean called Saba. And the reason that we were there specifically was there was a bioluminescent plankton that was doing its whole mating thing. And they only mate for like three days every couple of years and only there. You know, which is like super specific and weird. But we're there at the right time for it. So we're like, fuck yeah, we're going to do this. Seba, it's um, a steeper mountain on the island. And in the coast, it gets deeper pretty quickly. During the briefing, they tell us this. Use your flashlight as little as possible when you're descending and while you're on the surface. But at nighttime, man of wars actually are attracted by the light of the flashlights. Mm. So you got to be really careful. And they have long tendrils too. So even if you've gone down a few feet, you can still get stung. With us, it was very, very fast in the water and down. And we went down about 50 feet for this. We're down at the bottom. And the plan was that we were going to kneel at a sandy patch on the bottom and turn off all of our flashlights so that our eyes could adjust to the darkness and we'd be able to see the, the plankton, the bioluminescent plankton, because they glow a very, very faint blue. They make a pattern. They line themselves up and you'll see a blip and another blip and another blip and another blip in a helix. And that's, that's their whole mating thing. That sounds beautiful. It is. It's like watching helical stars around you underwater. So we're down there and we're sitting at the bottom. We're kneeling. And it is amazing. It's really, really amazing. And while this is going on, something is hitting my leg. Uh-oh. And my initial thought is, this is one of the other people on the dive hitting me with their flipper. Like, they're not trying to, but it's happening. It's relatively unpleasant. I can't focus on this with that going on. I really hope they stop. It keeps going for several minutes. You know, I don't want to turn on my flashlight and see who it is and yell at them because that's going to ruin our eyes being adjusted. But about four or five minutes of this, and I'm like, fuck it. I don't care anymore. 
So I turn on my flashlight and I whip around to see who the fuck is doing this. Except it's not one of my divers. It's an eight foot nurse shark. So nurse sharks are fine. They actually don't have teeth. They have these plates in their mouth. Mm. What they do is they go to the bottom and they get shellfish like crabs, lobsters, clams, oysters, whatever shellfish they can find. And they use those plates to crush up the exoskeletons and crush up the food. And that's what they eat. Mm. So they don't have teeth. But if they were to grab a hold of you with those plates, they could do some pretty serious damage. They still are sharks. They have a strong bite force. They're crushing up clams and oysters and stuff all day long. They're still pretty strong. They could crush whatever's in their mouth pretty easily. But they're not really aggressive either. So I'm looking at this shark that keeps hitting my leg, like ramming into my leg. It rams into it and it goes around and it rams into it again. And I'm like, what the hell? This is weird. So I give the shark a little nose pat and push it and send it on its way. I turn back around and we continue this for another 20 minutes of just watching the plankton. And all goes well, all goes pretty well. Well, we surface, we get out of the water, and I go up to one of the dive instructors, and I'm like, the hell was that? What was going on there? And they were like, well, I did see it. That's sharks' mating behavior. What sharks do when they mate is they will rub each other's, like, noses to scrape any, like, algae or barnacles or growth off of them, and then they will do the whole dominance flip thing which is what this shark was then trying to do to me. So yeah, what a shark does is they will grab like the female shark by the, one of the fins and essentially flip her onto her back as like a show of dominance thing. And then, you know, mating. And, and essentially flip. flip he had rubbed himself on my leg and he was ramming me to try and flip me because he couldn't, you know, see any fins. Could you say that the shark was maybe drowned bad? Oh my God. So the next two stories that I'm going to tell here are stories dealing with larger sharks. So this first story, same place. This is Saba, except this is a different side of the island. There's an underwater rock structure called the Pinnacle. And this structure essentially comes to a narrow point just below the surface, and it goes down for about 130, 140 feet. It goes deep. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called the Pinnacle. So we're over there. We jump in. This is during the daytime. We're descending and way, way out there. We have decent visibility. I want to say about 50 or so feet away from us, we can see a bull shark that is hunting for its food. It's terrorizing a small group of fish. In diver training, you are trained to deal with sharks. Like if you leave them alone, good chance they'll leave you alone. You don't really have to worry. The way that divers move is not fast paced and creating a lot of noise and splashing it's very focused on conserving your oxygen. So it's a lot of slow, deliberate movements. To the shark's point of view, you do not look like an injured prey. Yeah. You don't look like an easy target. You essentially look like a fucking alien to them, mm -hmm. but not food. We get down there. We're down at about 120, 130 feet for 10, 15 minutes, which is about as long as you can stay there because after that, you start getting too much nitrogen buildup mm -hmm. and you run out of air pretty quickly at that depth. So then you got to go back up and then you got to do what's called safety stops. On that dive, because we went so deep and we stayed there for a decent amount of time, we had to do two safety stops. The first safety stop you do at, I think, like 45 feet, maybe it's 60 feet. The second safety stop you do at 15 feet. Yeah, so we're doing our first safety stop. We see the shark off in the distance again because it's relatively short amount of time since we passed through. I should preface, I'm the closest one to this shark. All of a sudden, this shark stops going after the fish and makes a fucking rush at us, specifically me. Now, I had something that I was really disappointed in the rest of the divers there. They did not have it. You are taught to carry a dive knife. They typically have one sharp side and one serrated side. And some of them have like a gut hook that you would use, for example, say if you got caught in seaweed or an abandoned fishing net and you need to get yourself free, you have to cut yourself free. That's how you do it. Mm -hmm. This aggressive fucking bull shark is rushing at me and I pull out my dive knife and I swim a little off to the side 
and I stab this thing in the nose as it barely misses me. It was going for me. And it clearly didn't like that. And it came around. It circled around the rest of the divers. And then it cut through right back at me again. And I stabbed it again. One thing to say, my dive knife was not sharp at the point. So I wasn't like stabbing it. It was more like hitting it with a spoon. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work super well, but if you do it hard enough, I guess it's a deterrent. So after that second stab, Shark went back over to the school of fish and stopped bothering us. But yeah, that was essentially a shark attack right there. The entire rest of the time we were doing the safety stop, I did not take my eyes off of that shark and I did not stop looking down at all. This thing could change its mind at any second and come back at us. But after that, it was pretty uneventful. Yeah, bull sharks are dangerous. They're like the second most dangerous type of shark. Because it goes great white, then bull shark, then tiger shark, then mako. So bull sharks are number two on that list. They're aggressive and they absolutely can tolerate fresh water as well. So occasionally you'll hear like a news story of a bull shark all the way up in the Mississippi River. Mm. Which is, yeah, it's a little scary. The other close run-in I had with a shark was an absolute giant. I was doing marine conservation work in the Bahamas on an island called Eleuthera. What essentially we were doing that day was we would put out entire rotisserie chickens on really large hooks. And we would string them together about a quarter mile apart in this chain. And we'd leave it and we'd come back a few hours later. We were essentially looking for sharks so that we could tag the sharks and then release them. That day we caught a six foot lemon shark, an eight foot black tip reef shark. And then the big one, we caught a 14 foot lemon shark. Ooh. If you don't know what a lemon shark looks like, it looks like a great white, except instead of being gray, it's this weird like lemon color. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's got this like yellowy orangey hue to it they can grow quite large and they look mean and aggressive too they've got all the teeth there and this one in particular massive the way that we uh tagged them was a bit weird too this was a fairly low budget research program so what we would do is we'd pull them up with the hook and we'd take a slack line and we would strap the sharks to the side of the boat so they couldn't thrash around. And then one of us would have to get in the water with the shark with a razor sharp tag, stab it in the dorsal fin so that it has a tag on it. That's it. They let the shark go and you get out of the water. Hmm. I drew the short straw prior to finding out what we had reeled in. I had said that, oh, I'll do the uh, third shark. Well, yeah. That was before I knew I was facing down a 14-foot discolored great white. So I hop in the water with this thing. This thing thrashes. It thrashed so powerfully, it dented the hull of the boat. Oh my god. I'm in the water with this thing. It is clearly not happy. I stab it with the tag, and then I back up. They say, back up, back up, 10, 15 feet. And then they release the shark. I don't know why the fuck they didn't let me get out of it first. I think the actual answer is because it had already dented the hull of the boat. They didn't want to do more damage to the boat. Fucking hell. This shark swims right past the tip of the boat and comes right back around. And it is slowly going right at me. And then it doesn't go at me. It turns and goes right next to me. And it is eyeing me like fucking mm. eye to eye. It is eyeing me eye to eye. And I am watching this massive scary thing with teeth. Huge, huge, huge teeth. It goes right past me. And then it plunges. And I watch as this thing goes down. And it keeps going down and down and down into the inky blackness that is the abyss. That's when I realized... We're no longer over 90 feet of water. We're now over a 2,000 foot abyss. Ugh. I don't like it either. I don't like swimming in open water like that. I've seen enough Discovery Channel. I get the hell back on the boat <laughs> before this thing changes its mind and decides to torpedo me from below. But that was by far the largest shark I've seen in person. And yeah, I mean, the bull shark was scary, but it wasn't a 14 foot bull shark. Yeah, It was a smaller bull shark. And I had a knife. The knife worked. If this thing comes at me, one, it's coming up from below. Two, it's 14 feet. This thing could eat me whole. Mm -hmm. And three, 
I didn't have a dive knife on me. I didn't even have any diving equipment on me. I was snorkeling. I think the sheer shock value of having a shark that size basically, you know, intimidate me like that. And then watch it swim into the depths and realize I'm over the abyss. I'd have to say it's either the running out of air on the night dive or that. Yeah. I forget where where this took place. I know this took place like in, in a small bay area of an island in the Caribbean. And what happened was uh, we were down there. We were about 20 feet down. So not too far. And we found this really cool colored shrimp. Really weird looking thing. It was not a mantis shrimp. It had like red and white bands all over it. It was really cool. We spot this thing on the bottom and I hold my hand out next to it and it crawls up onto my hand. So it's sitting on my hand and I pick my hand up and I'm looking at it like this. I'm like, hi, little guy. While this thing's in my hand, one of the dive instructors comes from behind me and grabs me by the arm and pushes it down and then grabs me by the BCD and inflates it up all the way. So I go shooting to the top and she is dragging me up to the top too. And when we get up to the surface, she is yelling at me like blistering mad about how I shouldn't touch the marine life. First off, my take on nature is who the fuck cares if you touch it, if you're just like interacting with it. Like I didn't rudely grab it. I let this thing climb into my hand, never grabbed it. I just looked at it. Yeah. But that's like a decent enough interaction with the uh, marine life. It's, it's cool. You're there. Yeah. But that's What's the point like of diving if you're not like enjoying and taking in the reality of nature right there like if that hurts it then probably just being in there would hurt it but it doesn't yeah so she's yelling at me super super mad and i cut her off and i'm like do you have any idea what you just fucking did she's like yeah i stopped you from hurting that creature and i'm like hurting that creature by holding it no you really don't know you just inflated my bcd all the way and rocketed me to the top of the surface had we been deeper you could have killed me Because, yeah, that's rapid decompression. When you're underwater, the nitrogen in the air that you breathe gets absorbed into the tissues of your body. And if you go up too quickly, you get what's called the bends, decompression sickness. It forms little tiny bubbles all over your body. And it can really, really fuck you up. It can completely, like, permanently disable you. Had we been 10, 15 feet deeper, you absolutely would have, like, crippled me. You could have killed me. You acted impulsively and you easily could have injured me. She stopped talking and the color drained from her face and she was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'm like, yeah, that was impulsive and rash and unnecessary. I post no danger. She's like, well, you still shouldn't have done that. I'm like, you're fucking lucky I don't fucking call up the international authorities for fucking attempted murder there. She was super nice to me the rest of the trip. And I think it was because she felt really bad about having put me in that type of dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. So now I'm a certified master scuba diver and rescue diver. And and even back then, I would always designate my dive buddy as one of the dive instructors. Because people, normal people, are irrational and subject to panic. I just don't want to deal with that underwater. Mm -hmm. With the rescue diver training, they do train you on how to stop a panicking diver so the scuba tanks essentially on their back and you have to get up on their back and straddle the tank with your knees and grab onto their bcd controls and do a controlled slow ascent but that way they can't throw you off they can't grab you you know they're reaching back like this but you know you can't exactly reach you they can't kick you either when you're in that position just some important training Oh, we can talk about the time I got narked. Getting narked is what we divers call nitrogen narcosis. At extreme pressures, not only does the nitrogen affect your tissue, it affects your thinking. There's two types of nitrogen narcosis. The first type is the happy, joyous kind. You feel really euphoric. Your brain goes fuzzy. You have a lot of brain fog. The second kind is the panic kind. You start to panic. You don't know what you're doing anymore. You might swim down to get to the floor, even though you shouldn't be doing that. You're going way too deep, way too fast. Needless to say, both types of nitrogen narcosis are extremely dangerous. It is literally 
as incapacitating as a psychedelic trip. You could hallucinate cool things swimming around you, like birds or something swimming around you, and take off your mask and like just try and breathe normally underwater uh, and end up drowning yourself. Like it is that. really, really dangerous. And it did happen to me. So we were pretty far down. We were about 100 feet down. And we should have been using nitrox, which is a different blend of air that you put in scuba tanks to handle going deeper depths with less risk. We should have been using nitrox. We didn't have any nitrox. So while the dive was still technically safe, narcosis was a possibility. And I did get it. It was my first time going down that deep, about 100 feet. I started feeling weird, weird, weird. I started feeling very euphoric. Everything got really bright, and I was really happy. I was just sort of looking around. All of a sudden, I hear from behind me the diving instructor using a noisemaker to get my attention. That's when I looked around and didn't see anybody. And I looked down, and I didn't see anybody. And I looked up. And there they were, way up there, about 40 feet up there. Ooh. I had gone down past the recreational limit of 120 feet. I was probably about 135 feet down. Ooh. And I didn't even realize that I had gone that deep. Good thing is, I was down there for seconds. I literally sank and then came right back up. So that didn't really add anything to any decompressions that I'd have to make, even though I did give it an extra one or two minutes just for that on each of the stops. But that was my first time experiencing nitrogen narcosis and really understanding just how dangerous it is. It can easily kill you if you're not careful. So, you know, normal air is about like, what, 8% oxygen and then 21% CO2 and then like the rest of it's nitrogen or something like that, right? Nitrox gives you more oxygen, more CO2, and less nitrogen. So because you're inhaling less nitrogen, the nitrogen doesn't have as much of an impact on you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take the same precautions when going to that depth. Like the safety stops aren't as long, and you don't really have to worry about getting narked because there's not enough nitrogen to do that unless you go significantly deeper. With nitrox, I think you can go down about 160, 180 feet without really having to worry about getting narked. That's essentially what you can do. Also, keep an eye on your dive buddies. If you notice that your dive buddies are acting irrationally or sinking, you may have to grab a hold of them in that tank grapple and inflate their BCD and ascend about 10 feet or so. That should help. They'll start to snap back into reality. But it really is just like an awareness thing. Well, I'm glad you made it out of that. I could only have gone another 10 or 20 feet down to the bottom, which, worst case scenario, I make an extra decompression stop. Mm -hmm. Would have been fine. Had we been in open water, not fine. You know the term thalassophobia, right? Yeah. It's fear of open water, just like the, the vibe. I am a master fucking scuba diver with thalassophobia. Yes, I have had to do dives in deep open water. It really is something else. When you go down... And you can't see anything. You can't see the bottom at all. And you're just following a guideline down. And out of nowhere, the wreck of a giant 500 foot long battleship appears out of the depths like a fucking lost city. It's really cool, but it's also terrifying. Yeah. Like that just appeared out of fucking nowhere. Next time you're diving in a place that deep. Who knows what could appear? Two-thirds of this planet is covered in ocean. Even with scuba diving, that only unlocks about another 5 or 10%. But that 5 or 10% is a whole other alien world. It's so cool. I've seen octopus. I've seen entire fields of squid that change colors if you get closer to them. I've seen sharks. I've seen mantis shrimp. I've seen colorful landscapes like nothing I could have imagined. I've seen brain coral the size of cars. It's really cool down there. I've swam with sea lions. I've played with them, swimming in circles, nipping at each other's fins. I did that in the Galapagos. It really is a whole nother world down there. And it's one that very few people actually get to experience and explore. Yeah, it's worth it. Tell me a story, I wanna hear it. You might think it's boring, but I'm interested.
interested Tell me a story, I wanna hear it You might think it's boring, but I'm interested